Um, so good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in for today's lecture, which is part of the Women in Surgery Interest Group Lecture Series. Um, first and foremost, I would like to ask if everybody could please mute their microphones in order for us to communicate better. Um, all right, so my name is Joelle Shami. I'm the MET2 representative, and today, today we have the honor of receiving Dr. Subra as our guest lecturer. Dr. Maher Subra is an assistant professor of pediatric surgery at the American University of Beirut. He had completed his medical studies at AUB before becoming a resident in the Division of General Surgery at AUB also. He then completed his fellowship in pediatric surgery at Southampton General Hospital in the UK. Today's lecture will be the first of two consecutive lectures given by Dr. Subra. Um, so, um, to, so during this lecture, we would like to kindly ask you to please mute your microphones as we will be taking questions all throughout in the chat box. So please, please feel free to type in any inquiries or questions or concerns that you might have. So first, uh, I would like to thank you. Uh, thanks, women surgeons, for inviting me to give this uh, these two lectures. Uh, the first one will be about congenital abdominal wall hernias in pediatric age group. And the second one will be in, in next few days uh, is about esophageal atresia and tracheoesophageal fistula and the management of it. Um, I, I am a pediatric surgeon at AUB, uh, and I have um, um, prepared the lecture in a way to make it quite comprehensive, uh, to give you a, an oversight about each entity and um, to deal with each entity in, on the practical uh, side. So the first topic uh, today will be about pediatric abdominal wall hernias and the ARB few of these in the abdominal wall of the pediatric patient. So we'll go through most of them. And then uh, I'll try to finish in 50 minutes. And if you have uh, 10 minutes of question, you can uh, ask me and then uh, I can, um, we can discuss and give you my answers. So let's start with the abdominal, hernia, uh, abdominal wall hernias, and let's see how many uh, do we have. Well, if you look at the abdominal wall, there are many kinds of hernias. Um, now, um, we have the umbilical hernia, which is the most common hernia. If, if we want to statistically um, check which hernia is the most common, it's umbilical hernia. It's the most common in the pediatric age group. Uh, so we'll talk about it. Then we'll talk about the variant of the umbilical hernia, which is the super umbilical hernia. Uh, you will have to know about what is epigastric hernia and diastasis recti, which is something rare, but you have to know about it. Uh, Spigelian hernia is mentioned in textbooks, so we'll have to pass uh, through it and uh, just to have an overview about it. Now, the, the second most common hernia in the abdominal wall is the inguinal hernia, which is very similar to the femoral hernia. But uh, it will not be part of our uh, discussions today because uh, this you will get it in other uh, topics and uh, it will take some time to discuss fully the inguinal hernia. Incisional hernia is not a congenital hernia. It is a hernia that is acquired following any surgery on the abdominal wall. And then we will conclude our discussion by talking about the two major congenital abdominal wall defects, which are gastroschisis and omphalocele. So in this way, we will be covering the whole topic of abdominal wall hernias. And uh, I think, um, I hope we can really pass through them all uh, and give you an overview. So let's start first with an umbilical hernia. Well, umbilical hernia is the most common hernia. It occurs at the congenit at the natural opening of the umbilicus. So it is a central hernia. And you remember when the when the child is born or the fetus is born, uh, there is the umbilical cord is always attached to the umbilicus. And it will take around one week to 10 days for the umbilical cord to desiccate and fall down. And therefore, any bulge at the umbilical area will not appear to the parents or to the mother of the baby uh, before a period of 10 days to two weeks uh, passes by. Uh, so basically, the, the clinical presentation of an umbilical hernia does not happen uh, before two weeks, 
And it is at this time that the parents uh, will notice a bulge when the baby is crying. So basically, um, it will not appear before the umbilical stump falls, which is a period of 10 days to two weeks after delivery of the baby. Now, what the parents will see is a bulge that appears in the midline at the umbilicus whenever the baby is crying or straining and or uh, exerting any, valsalva, any kind of valsalva or maneuver or increasing the abdominal pressure. Umbilical hernia, just remember, it is completely asymptomatic. So if the parents ask you, well, it is causing the child, uh, my child pain, well, the hernia is not causing the pain. And probably the child has colic from something else. And because of the crying of the baby, uh, the hernia is appearing. So it is a bulge at the umbilicus upon straining and that disappears upon relaxation. Now, just um, this is a picture of a normal umbilicus. Uh, you have to know that uh, the normal umbilicus now, nowadays is an important area of the abdomen and it is a cosmetic area. So uh, basically, if you look at the umbilicus, there is a puckered down center uh, which is called the cicatrix. Uh, this cicatrix, it means that the skin is directly attached to the linea alba in the midline. Now, the circle that is around the cicatrix is, uh, co uh, is called the umbilical fold. So we have the lateral folds and the anterior and the posterior fold or the superior and lower fold. So this is a normal umbilicus. Now, if you have, if you look at an umbilical hernia in a pediatric patient, then you can see on the left a small umbilical hernia, which is a classical appearance. And also, it might be really quite big. And if you look on the right side, it's a big umbilical hernia, large. Uh, sometimes it is uh, described as an elephant trunk type of hernia. Uh, now, just remember, the size of the bulge is not a determinant of whatever management we're going to do. It's just related to the elasticity of the skin. Now, Umbilical hernias, for some reason, do not complicate in children. Now, there might be some complication in adults. It might produce complication in adult patients. However, congenital umbilical hernias in pediatric seldom complicates. And this is in contradistinction to inguinal hernia. And this has direct effects on the plan of management and, or, or, or how we're going to manage these children. The second thing, the second fact is that 95% of these hernias will resolve spontaneously by the age of three to four years. So the defect in the linea alba, which is a circular defect, the congenital defect, will start closing progressively, and it has a chance of 95% to close till the age of three to four years. It might close after one month, two months, three months, but it might continue closing till the age of three to four years. So, to go back, the examination, therefore, of a hernia is to document, yeah, the you have to document the hernia to see it, to diagnose it. And then the second part of the examination at the clinic is to put your finger over the hernia and try to feel the size of the facial defect. And this defect, as I told you, is a round defect, and you can measure relatively objectively the size. Now, so having all these facts and this information, something asymptomatic does not complicate, might resolve in 95% of cases within three to four years. If we ask what is the question, what is the treatment of umbilical hernia if they present at an early age? Well, basically the answer is obvious. It is expected observation till around the age of three to four years. However, as surgeons, in our minds, we have to put what are in our mind, what are the indications to operate on an inguinal hernia? Okay, so basically, we have to look what are the indications to operate on an umbilical hernia. And it is clear in my mind that there are three indications to operate. Of course, it's obvious that if you have a child above the age of four years, then this is a direct indication to operate on an umbilical hernia because it if it would have resolved it if it wanted to resolve. Second, it is not the size of the outside bulge. We have to measure the size of the defect. And if the size of the defect, the diameter of it, is more than 15 millimeter or 1.5 centimeter, then it is too big to close on its own. And therefore, you can plan surgery. You can put the patients and the family or the family of the patient in the, in the context of uh, really uh, surgical treatment. And you can do it at any time electively. 
Now, uh, the other indication is that you can follow up your patients for maybe two visits apart, six months apart. And if the size of the defect is not decreasing in size, then what are we waiting for? I mean, the defect is not in decreasing in size spontaneously, and you can decide for operation. So these are the three indications to operate an umbilical hernia. Now, uh, the operation is uh, what's called the mayo repair. So it is a cosmetic area, as I told you. So a cosmetic incision has to be made. It should be made as a reverse smiling incision below the umbilicus. You just dissect the subcutaneous tissue until you reach the hernial sac. And once you reach the hernial sac, usually it is attached to the skin of the umbilicus. So it is separated. It should be separated like here from the skin of the umbilicus. Then the sac is opened and excised or closed, uh, yani excised and closed. And then we close the surgical defect, the, the defect in the linea alba, the fascia, with very strong good sutures in order to prevent recurrence. And then the last stitch that we put is a stitch between the linea alba and the underneath side of the skin in order to pucker the skin inside and to create what is called the cicatrix, as I told you, in the midline of the umbilicus. Then the incision is closed in a very cosmetic fashion. Now, the operation is a simple operation, but it should be cosmetic operation. The incision should not extend without the, the folds of the umbilicus. And in fact, at the end of the surgery, if you follow up your patient six months following the surgery, you should not see the scar. It should be embedded within the folds of the umbilicus. Now, I'm showing you this picture here because you might see it with your friends, your colleagues, any adult, maybe you know, the, uh, as a pediatric surgeon, we got a, we get a lot of pre-adolescent or adolescent children coming with this appearance. If you look at the umbilicus, it, it doesn't look normal. There is like a polyp at, in, inside the umbilicus. Now, what could this be? This could be a umbilical polyp, or it could be a granuloma that got um, uh, that was not treated in umbilical granuloma congenital that got epitheliaized and covered by skin. However. Uh, it could be also a very small umbilical hernia that did not heal. If you ask the patient how to differentiate, if you ask the patient to stain and you feel that this small bulge is bulging even more or getting go uh, going in size, it means that there is a very small umbilical defect. Now, this defect is not enough to cause any symptoms or affect the fun functions and the actions of the patient. Uh, however, it is cosmetically disfiguring. And many of these pre-adolescent boys and girls come to our clinics because they want to, to treat this cosmetic appearance. And we just deal with it as a small umbilical hernia. We do the same umbilical hernia surgery. And the reason for the operation, as I mentioned, will be cosmetic. Now, having uh, finished with umbilical hernia, we have to, to, to discuss what is called supra-umbilical or para-umbilical hernia, you have to know about it. Now, this is a confusing thing because for pediatricians, many times they are, these patients are referred to us as an umbilical hernia. However, it is a little bit different and there are subtle differences between it and between umbilical hernia. Now, from, from the clinical perspective, this is also a bulge at the umbilicus that is that appears upon straining and this appears upon relaxation. Uh, it is asymptomatic, uh, it doesn't produce any pain, and does not complicate. So it is the same clinically presentation as an umbilical hernia. However, by physical exam, if you look at it uh, very carefully, you can see that the bulge is mostly not in the middle of the umbilicus, it's mostly at the superior border or superior fold of the umbilical, of the umbilicus. And you can also notice that the cicatrix probably is attached to the linea alba. So it is very subtle appearance that shows that the bulge is mostly on the upper border of the umbilicus. Uh, now, the other thing difference is that when you palpate, and remember then when I, to when I told you and I discussed that the, the defect in an umbilical hernia is a circular defect. Here, if you palpate the defect, it looks like a horizontal defect. It's a horizontal linear type of defect. And once you feel this defect that is linear, it is a pathognomonic. It is diagnostic of what's called a supraumbilical hernia. Now, why I'm mentioning this, if it is the same as an umbilical hernia clinically, I'm mentioning it because 
This defect is not a congenital defect of the umbilical stump itself, it's, uh, or the umbilical space itself. It's a defect of the linea alba, and it will not disappear if you wait on it. So the only difference is that really, it is not worthwhile waiting on super umbilical hernia. Once you diagnose it and you are sure about it, you can tell the parents uh, that that child will need surgery, surgical repair, and of course you can do it at an elective uh, date. So this is the main difference, and I need to mention that. Now, what is epigastric hernia? It's the third most common hernia. So basically, I'm going to tell you the story and then discuss what is the pathology. The classical history of presentation is a child who has grown up maybe above the age of six or seven years, and suddenly, because of a forceful um, forceful pressure on the abdomen because of a strong valsalva maneuver, a cuff, a sneeze. What happens is that this child suddenly feels pain somewhere between the epigastrium and the umbilicus, and this pain is accompanied with a bulge at that area that is a tender bulge. So when he puts his finger or her finger over this bulge, the, uh, the bulge is painful, is tender. Now, I'm showing you two pictures. In order to see this bulge at the clinic, you have to ask the child either to uh, exhale and, and retract his abdominal wall, and you can see it on the left, whereas the picture on the right is whenever the child exerts a, a valsalva maneuver. So this is a way to see an epigastric hernia. Once you see it, you can palpate it and you can feel a nodule. Now, this is a little bit distressing to the parents and a little bit um, misguiding to the pediatrician because uh, the parents will, will worry because of this nodule that there might be some kind of a tumor or something, and then they refer the patient to the pediatrician who uh, um, the pediatrician will refer back to the pediatric surgeon. Now, once we see it, it's it's simple clinical diagnosis. So what has happened here? What has happened is that because of the forceful pressure inside the abdomen uh, the, and because of the presence of a congenital defect, this is defect has been present since birth in the linea alba, somewhere in the linea alba, and uh, this defect has been present this birth, but because of the forceful pressure at this age, uh, a piece of properitoneal fat, which is a fat of the, the visceral fat of the abdomen, uh, a piece of this fat has uh, got through this um, opening and got incarcerated. Now, why is it tender? Because sometimes it is not only incarcerated, it is strangulated. So there's a little bit of ischemia, uh, which causes some inflammation of this nodule. So, so going back, it is a two to three millimeter defect. It is present between the xiphoid and the umbilicus anywhere. And the defect is present since birth, but does not appear except for a few years after birth until the child is able to, to exert enough pressure. And it doesn't lead to any complications except for this bulge that is tender and a little bit cause discomfort to the patient. And therefore, the reason the indication is to, to remove it is that it will not, you have to, to, to take care of it uh, because uh, the child will not be able to have normal activity. They will always have discomfort from it whenever they exert some uh, forceful activities. The treatment is, of course, surgical. And it is simple closure of the defect. However, you have to open exactly over the lump, over the bulge. And uh, once you open the sub-Q, you can identify the visceral fat, which looks different in color. You excise it during the surgery. You identify the two to three millimeter defect, put two or three stitches in it, and then do a cosmetic closure. Now, what is the trick uh, about this? The only trick that you have to remember is that once you put the patient under anesthesia, many times it might be very difficult to identify your site of epigastric hernia because you will not be able to feel the, the piece of properitoneal fat. And because of that, just remember, it's very important to remember that you have to mark this hernia before putting the patient under anesthesia. So this is a take-home message regarding this kind of hernia. Now, the fourth kind is something called diastasis recti. I have to mention this. It is rare, but if your family or neighbors or somebody ask you about what is this losange kind of appearance or bulge in my child, 
it looks like a losange uh, appearance. Uh, and this is a bulge that occurs between um, the epigastrium and the umbilicus, sometimes around the umbilicus. Now, this is not a hernia, classically. It is not like a defect in the linear alba. It is only widening and thinning out of the linear alba. So it is a weak linear alba. Uh, and this is called diastasis recti. And uh, well, basically, it produces no symptoms. It is only the appearance of it. And what you have, um, you know, the treatment is expectant because as a child goes out, uh, goes up, and the abdominal wall goes bigger, uh, it will disappear spontaneously with age. But I need to mention it. Now, Spigelian hernia, you read it in every textbook, you see it in every um, document about uh, abdominal wall hernias. Uh, practically, to tell you the truth, I've been practicing pediatric surgery for many years, but I have not seen a single Spigelian hernia. So, but you have to know about it. So as a pediatric surgeon, um, I have not much experience with it. It is very rare in childhood. Uh, it is more encountered in adults. Now, what is the principle of it? Is It's an anatomical principle. You have the two lines um, that join inside the abdomen. One line is called the line semi-lunaris, which is uh, the edge of the rectus muscle on each side. And you have the line that is called semicircularis, which is a distance two-thirds uh, between umbilicus and symphysis pubis. This area of junction between these two lines, there's something called the spigelian belt. And this is an area where you can get a, a hernia. Now, this hernia usually does not present classically as a bulge that appears and disappears. Uh, it usually incarcerates and strangulates. So basically, you will get uh, sudden pain in that area with a palpable bulge, and you have to suspect it if it is exactly in that area. And the only way to diagnose it is by doing a CT scan of the abdominal wall. And this is a picture of a CT scan of the abdominal wall that shows you here the herniation of the bowel within the abdominal wall through the defect in the spaginian hernia. Of course, the treatment is surgical closure of the hernia. Now, the, the second part of this uh, presentation is about the major, the two major abdominal wall defects. And uh, these are congenital defects, and these are really um, major challenges for the pediatric surgeon. They are called gastroschisis and omphalocele. Now, both these defects, unlike other hernias, they present immediately at birth. So it's an immediate diagnosis, and there's no difficulty in diagnosing them uh, when the baby is born. So let's talk first about gastroschisis. Now, this is a picture of gastroschisis, and I'm going to describe the, what you see here is bowels herniating. It could be small and large bowel. Sometimes it's part of the stomach also herniating. But what you see here is that the bulge is on the right side of the abdomen, and the umbilical cord is to the left side. The umbilical cord is a normal cord attached to a normal umbilicus, whereas a defect is separate from the umbilicus on the right side. So this is something very important. The second important thing is that the bowels are not covered by any membrane or any sac. So these bowels, this is gastroschisis. By definition, it is not covered by any sac. Now, because these bowels have been in exposure with the amniotic fluid in the womb of the mother, and the amniotic fluid is irritant to the bowels, these bowels might get irritated. So this is something very important, and it has its implication about the management of these patients. Now, the incidence is quite rare. It's one in 10,000 birth. It depends on the demographic area you belong to. Now, because of, as I mentioned, the exposure of the amniotic fluid to the bowel and the bowel to the amniotic fluid uh, and the irritation of the bowel, you might get irritation of the bowel, as you see it here, maybe thickening of the bowel wall or the serosa of the bowel. And sometimes, uh, really, you might get a peel, like a peel and attachment, like adhesions between the bowel loops. And in addition, because of the narrow defect, you might get vascular compromise of the bowels, and that's why gastroschisis is usually associated with intestinal problems, like uh, uh, intestinal atresia is quite common in cases of uh, gastroschisis. Okay, 
Now, what is the cause of Gaza? Why should the abdominal wall not close on the right side of the umbilicus? Until now, the truth is that we don't know. And there are theories, multiple theories about it. I have put the two most common theories. One is that with the abdominal, the somatic parts of the abdominal wall that close on both sides, they start by closing on the left, but there is a delay in closure from the right side. Another uh, theory is that uh, there is an omphalomesenteric artery uh, and there might be some, uh, thrombosis of this artery and that's why the right one or the right one and that's why you might get disruption of the abdominal wall which can get its blood supply from it. So these are theories but there's nothing uh, yet confirmed about this. Now in every in major congenital anomaly in pediatric, we talk now about prenatal diagnosis. So the question is, can this gastroschisis be diagnosed prenatally? Of course, it's very obvious. It should be very clear to the obstetrician that there is gastroschisis. You can see the bowels herniating here, and there is no cover of the bowel. This is also another picture here for, with a different cut on the ultrasound. So it can be diagnosed prenatally. Why is it important to diagnose it prenatally? Because of the prenatal management or what should we do prenatally if we diagnose it now basically uh, what we have to think is whether the mother should deliver the baby through a normal delivery or a c-section delivery in gastro cases it's still recommended to deliver through a vaginal delivery because it will not affect really the type uh, i mean it will not affect the gastro cases the type of delivery now however we can advise the mother that she should deliver in a tertiary care center in a specialized center where the baby uh, can be taken care of by pediatric anesthesiologists, pediatric intensivists, and pediatric surgeons. Now, the prognosis in general, uh, when we talk about prognosis with the family, with the parents of the child, uh, in gastrous cases, it's usually good. So we give them a good prognosis. We tell them it's a surgical matter. We, uh, we, it's, a, it's an intestinal problem. Uh, we will deal with the post, uh, post-surgery and your, the, the mortality and the morbidity uh, are relatively minimal. Uh, why, why is this? Because this entity is not associated usually with other anomalies. It's only associated with intestinal anomalies, as I mentioned previously. Now, when the baby is born, the immediate management, because the bubbles are exposed, we have to cover the bubbles immediately with an impermeable kind of material. Okay, we can see here pure nylon covering the uh, the intestines. Uh, why is this? Because we don't want to evaporate uh, eva- fluid evaporation and fluid loss. And we have to directly resuscitate with intravenous fluid. Of course, we have to decompress the stomach and decompress the bowels in order to try to reduce them. And we have to assume that there is contamination, so we have to start both spectrum antibiotics. Now, as far as the strategic management, I will have to follow this algorithm, which I really like. If the gastroschisis is simple, it means that the bowels are normal, not affected, there's no reaction on the bowels. We have to check one of two things. Is it reducible? I mean, can the bowel fit inside the abdominal cavity? If it is as such, then immediately what we can do is either reduce at the bedside and plug it, and then it will heal on its own, or we can go to the operating room and close it as a primary, a simple operation. Now, if it is not reducible, and by judgment, there is a large amount of intestines outside, or the abdominal cavity is quite small, then what we have to do is delayed reduction or stage reduction. So what we have to do is cover it with a bag, what's called a silo. And there are different kinds of bags. And uh, it could be also, this bag could be sutured or not sutured. So there are some kind of bags that you can apply without suturing to the abdominal wall to the fascia of the abdominal wall, and then do it progressively. So what you do is tuck it. So what you do is progressively put more progressive pressure and decrease the size of the sac until it becomes flat, and then you can take the patient back to the to the surgery and close it completely. So you do stage repair. Now, in cases where the bowels are affected, they have problem in the bowel, there is necrosis, there is ischemia, there is atresia, there is major inflammation, then in such cases, uh, you have to treat surgically. So you have to get the patient down to the operating room and decide what you want to do about the bowel. Now, this is a picture of a gastroschisis with complicated bowel, where you have atresia, and there is some kind of necrosis segment here. So in such cases, you can decide, sorry, um, either 
you can decide either uh, for the for the uh, if you have uh, uh, inflated bowel, of course you have to uh, and the cause bowel, of course you have to remove it, you have to resect it. But the question for the surgeon and there are controversies about this. After you resect it, should you do a primary anastomosis or not? Because the bowel is inflamed, and if you do primary anastomosis, you might be running the risk of leakage, which is uh, leak seepage of fluid from the anastomosis. So some surgeons do primary anastomosis, some other surgeons do enterostomies. Enterostomies meaning opening the bowel to the abdominal wall and let it drain to the abdominal wall. Now, the other thing, uh, question, uh, if you see an atresia in the bowels, should you deal with it immediately at the initial um, operation? So should you resect it and do anastomosis? So also surgeons, pediatric surgeons are divided. Some of them do that. But others also, what, what they'd like to do is just reduce the bowels without dealing with atresia, just leave it for a few weeks there, give the patient TPN, you know, just treat him uh, and uh, get the bowels to the normal, uh, normal consistency because when you keep them inside the abdomen, they will return to normal consistency and then deal with atresia later on. So there are some questions uh, from the surgeon at the time of the surgery. Now, what is the outcome of gastroschisis? Well, it is good because it is not associated with any major anomalies. It is only how to deal with the baby from the surgical perspective and also from the medical perspective. Now, because of the reaction of the, uh, the exposure of the bowel to the amniotic fluid, these bowels will not return to normal activity immediately. This is something very peculiar and uh, specific to gastroschisis. So basically, you have to expect a prolonged ileus. Even if you do the best surgery, the baby bowel will not work within immediately. It will need a few days, sometimes a few weeks, to return to normal activity. And during this time, you have to support the baby with TPN. And therefore, they will need prolonged TPN, as mentioned here. And um, there are some complications associated with it, with, gastro with uh, gastroschisis, like short gut syndrome, if you need to resect a lot of bowel, and, you know, cholestatic liver disease, which is a complication of prolonged uh, TPN. Moving on to omphalocele, which is the opposite, which is the other major congenital anomaly. The omphalocele is completely different. It's a central abdominal wall defect. It's just in the middle, at the site of the umbilicus, and it is covered by a peritoneal sac. So this is a classical omphalocele, and you can directly, uh, you know, um, make the difference between the two. Uh, now, the incidence of omphalocele is one in 4,000 births, so it is more common than gastroschisis, and it is a congenital defect at the site of the umbilicus. Now, because of the covering of the bowel by the peritoneum, the bowel is not injured and is not affected, and therefore you can anticipate much earlier return to normal bowel activity and to oral feeds. So, and you can anticipate much less need to to total parenteral nutrition, to TPN. Now, however, the downside of omphalocele is that it is associated with a lot of anomalies, with uh, 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 chromosomal abnormalities uh, and with other uh, associated malformation like central nervous system malformation, cardiovascular malformation, and other malformation. And if you have these malformations that are associated with omphalocele, then the prognosis uh, is bad and uh, therefore it's affected by these anomalies. Now, when we see an omphalocele, we have to classify it into two parts. Uh, if you look at the left, it is a simple, it's like a large umbilical hernia. So uh, it, uh, it is a peritoneal coverage, it is not skin covering, but it looks like a large umbilical hernia. This is called minor omphalocele. Whereas on the right side, you can see what is called a major omphalocele. Now, what is a major omphalocele? It's any omphalocele that contains liver, by definition. Containing liver is a major, or an omphalocele where the defect of the fascia, facial defect of the linea alba is more than five centimeter in diameter. Um, these are called major and they are really a challenge to the pediatric surgeon. Now, can it be diagnosed prenatally? Of course, it can be diagnosed prenatally, and it is very the differentiation between it and gastroschisis can be made very easily because the coverage of the omphalocele can be quite well seen. Now, why is it important to diagnose it prenatally? Of course, it's important because also we can 
advise the parents and counsel them before delivery. So first, this fetus who has an omphalocele because of the anomalies has to have more tests uh, like karyotype. Uh, we have to do specific ultrasounds, really detailed ultrasound to check for cardiac, uh, cardiovascular anomalies, craniofacial anomalies, central nervous system anomalies. Uh, and when we discover these anomalies, then we can talk about the prognosis of these children and what is associated mortality and morbidity. And then we can also contemplate the possibility of termination of pregnancy. So this is why it's important to diagnose prenatally. Now, one other technical factor is that in omphalocele major, we might decide to do a C-section because of easier delivery, especially when it is quite big omphalocele uh, major. Now, when the baby is born, the, the difference in management is that really here we don't have major fluid loss, and therefore we can take our time in dealing with the patient, um, at least in resuscitating the patient. Uh, but the most important thing post uh, delivery is to check for associated anomalies, to check the, the baby, and to make a full cardiac uh, evaluation. So emergency uh, repair or uh, emergency uh, reduction is not as important as in gastroschisis, where you have exposed bowels. Now, I would like to follow this organogram or uh, algorithm uh, for uh, omphalocele. Now, the first thing to check if it is omphalocele major or omphalocele minor, yani if, is the liver herniated or not? Is it a big one or not? If it is not a big omphalocele, it's not an omphalocele major, then the treatment is primary closure. Now, if it is an omphalocele major, now, it depends on the situation of the baby. If the baby has major cardiac anomalies uh, and he is really the morbid type of baby, and, and, you know, uh, not in a good condition, then you might not need to do anything except just paint the omphalocele with some kind of dry, uh, drying material. They call it iscarizing solution like iodine uh, or saline or hypertonic saline or um, mercurochrome. Uh, they used. Uh, I mean, these are solutions that will dry up the surface of the omphalocele, the peritoneal coverage, and when it dries out, it will take long time, but then it will re-epitalize. It's called iscarization process. Now, however, if the baby can tolerate and is not in a bad condition, and he has an omphalocele major, then the surgeon has to check and to evaluate, does he have enough space in the abdominal cavity, yes or no? If there is enough abdominal space in the abdominal cavity, then we go directly to the surgery and the preferred thing is primary closure, immediate full closure. If there is not enough space inside the abdominal cavity by assessment, then we deal with it like we dealt with a major, gas, uh, with a major gastroschisis by putting a silo, you know, this bag, and it could be also a sutured or a non-sutured kind of bag, and we do what is called the staged closure. I'm going to show you, these are pictures of primary, of omphalocele closed by primary uh, closure, facial closure. What you can see here is the fascia being approximated and closed uh, together. Of course, uh, cosmesis, we don't, we don't uh, uh, tackle cosmesis immediately uh, because you will not have a normal um, umbilical appearance initially. Uh, we can tackle this at a later date. Now, uh, these are two types of silo closure. This is a Gore-Tex kind of silo that is sutured to the abdominal wall. And what happens is that this, these babies are uh, treated on, at, the bed, at the bedside, on, and every day you can tuck or decrease the size of the silo progressively until it flattens out. And then when it flattens out, you can take the child to the operating room and achieve the full closure. Uh, this is another type of sutureless uh, type of silo where you have a spring coil at the bottom end of the bag let's say of the nylon bag, and you can place this uh, spring, goal, uh, spring uh, below uh, the fascia of the abdominal wall, and then you can start tucking. There are also other ways. Sometimes you can put like foam around uh, the omphalocele and then, you know, pressurize it. So there are different techniques and different ways, but they all follow the same principle whereby you keep it out, and you start decreasing it, the size progressively, in order to allow the abdominal cavity to grow progressively. 
and to accommodate the bowels without any compromise on ventilatory uh, status of the patient. So this is uh, the picture of a non fallacy that was treated by iscarization. Yeah, the drying out of the covering and then epitalization. But this is only delaying, delaying the problem because these children will end up with a major ventral hernia later on that you will need to tackle later on. And it might be really quite difficult to tackle it also later on and challenging. Now, what is the difference post-op? The bowel function is normal. Uh, it will return to normal immediately. You will not have a prolonged ileus and then you can carry on with early feeds. The overall mortality, however, is not good because of the associated anomalies. If there are no associated anomalies, then it is only a technical operation, and then you can really save more than 90% of these children. Now, what is the take-home message here for you is that really we have to make in our minds the completely the differentiation between omphalocele and gastroschisis. So I will go through them. The position is central in omphalocele. It is to the right in gastroschisis, to the right of the umbilicus. There is a hernial sac in omphalocele. It is absent in gastroschisis. The bowel are not, bowels are not covered. The umbilical cord insertion is in the midline on the sac in omphalocele. It is a normal umbilical stump um, attachment to a normal umbilicus. What happened? Yes, to a normal umbilicus uh, uh, in gastroschisis. Associated anomalies, just remember, frequent in omphalocele, rare in gastroschisis, whereas intestinal problems are rare in omphalocele, it's opposite, and more frequent in gastroschisis. And the return of bowel activity, as mentioned earlier, it is quite early in omphalocele, so you can plan an early discharge once you do the operation, whereas it is prolonged in gastroschisis, and you have to tell the parents that the expectation to take the baby home is not going to be soon. They will have to stay for a few days, a few weeks sometimes in the hospital. So thank you very much. I hope I can uh, I give you an overview of the major hernias in the abdominal wall in pediatric that we deal with. Uh, it is not a monotonous subject because it is a variant of cases that you can get. And uh, it's uh, quite challenging to deal with the big ones, uh, the major ones, uh, major omphalocele and big uh, or major gastroschisis. So thank you, and I will be waiting your questions. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you, so much, Doctor. Thank you and uh, I... I'll be giving you the next lecture in a few days' time, inshallah. Okay, take care. Thank you, and thanks for everybody Thank for you. attending.